Hello, friends. Putin's cook, Prigozhin, recently sued the editors-in-chief of Nyaduza and Duvad, as well as journalist and politician Maxim Shachenko. Prigozhin demanded that the court defend his honor, dignity, and professional reputation. It sounds absurd. How could the manager of the Olganskaya troll factory be honorable at all? What dignity does a man whose employees were implicated in the murders of Russian journalists really have? And forget about any sort of professional reputation. Prigozhin is trying with all his might to hide the truth about his past affairs. He filed as many as 15 lawsuits in 2016 against Yandex, demanding the removal of defamatory material under the so-called right-to-be-forgotten law. The law was conceived and adopted by the Putin Duma, specifically to protect the gangsters and criminals in power. Using this law, a high-profile gangster with a history of petty crime is demanding this allegedly defaming material be removed. Prigozhin's lawsuit against Yandex was later withdrawn. Perhaps because the court only drew more attention to his disposition and past indiscretions. Because Putin's cook has a very dirty secret, and it can't easily be hidden or removed. Prigozhin is very careful about hiding his criminal record. As a matter of fact, his lawsuit against the journalists, which I raised at the beginning of this video, was filed because his criminal past had been mentioned. So if a man like Prigozhin is doing his best to cover up a criminal record, then it's time for us to talk about it. Yevgeny Prigozhin, Putin's cook and charge d'affaires, has been tried twice. His first conviction dates to 1979. He was then given a two-year suspended sentence under Article 144, Part 2, Property Theft. The suspended sentence didn't change a thing. And soon after, in 1981, Prigozhin was brought back before the court on more serious charges. Theft, fraud, robbery, and involving minors in criminal activity. Side note. In contrast with Putin's era, there were special political articles in the criminal code during Soviet times. Back then, opposition politicians were rarely prosecuted on criminal charges. Why bother trumping up charges when you could just imprison anyone for anti-Soviet activities? Thus, in those days, if someone was actually prosecuted, the legal grounds were typically genuine. So let's take a look at Prigozhin's criminal history. Between the 22nd and 27th of February 1980, Bushman and Prigozhin, having entered apartment number 30 of House 24 on Molina Avenue, stole property from the room of citizens Ozipov in the amount of 177 rubles. On the night of March 1st, Prigozhin, while attempting to break into apartment 2 of House 12 on Ronchinskaya Street for the purpose of stealing personal property, squeezed through the apartment window but did not carry out his criminal act to the end as he was caught by witnesses. As you can see, Nowadays, Prigozhin is less afraid of regular citizens. If he is caught red-handed, he doesn't run away, but instead takes them to court. Furthermore, on the night of March 2nd, Bushman and Prigozhin conspired to commit the theft of personal property, including a tape recorder, a radio receiver, two carpets, crystal, and other items. A tape recorder, a radio receiver, and two carpets. That's the scale of his crimes. Prigozhin was never squeamish about this sordid career. March 14th, at about 12 o'clock, Prigozhin and Bushman used a crowbar to steal the following property. A cover for a car steering wheel, candles, and a set of pens. There are a lot of questions concerning Prigozhin and minors. According to the verdict, Prigozhin and others, aware that one of the participants was underage, involved him in drunkenness, consuming alcohol with him in restaurants and at an acquaintance's apartment, and in addition, involving him in criminal activity, having committed theft and robbery with him. I have read enough to give you an impression of the honor, dignity, and professional reputation of this man who is now harassing journalists. But this next part tops the rest. After leaving the Ocean restaurant, they met a previously unknown woman, Korolova. Prigozhin suggested to his accomplices that they rob this individual. Prigozhin grabbed her by the neck and began strangling her. Prigozhin continued to strangle Korolova until she lost consciousness. After that, they took her boots and gold earrings. He choked her until she lost consciousness just to steal boots and earrings. 
He led a group of men against the lone woman. Prigozhin is not a doctor, and strangulation is not a safe anesthetic. Losing consciousness or dying, it's just a matter of luck. And all for a pair of boots and earrings. I can't say that Prigozhin's actions can be described as honorable or dignified. The man's reputation is crystal clear. The case is not based on a hypothesis. Prigozhin's confession is contained within the verdict. In the media, Prigozhin has been nicknamed Putin's cook. Putin even celebrated his birthday at Prigozhin's restaurant, and Prigozhin's companies regularly provide catering services to the Kremlin. Is the Federal Protective Service okay with Putin being served by a man with that kind of history? Aren't they afraid that Prigozhin will strangle the president to steal his shoes or watch? Are they not worried about keeping the cover on the presidential limo steering wheel? Or how about the Kremlin's carpets? More importantly, is Putin okay with keeping such company? Well, Putin is no stranger to it. He came up in the very same gangster era of St. Petersburg. Now's a good time to remember Putin's entourage. The epitaph on the grave of Putin's wrestling coach read, I died, but the mafia is forever. Putin is well acquainted and conducted business affairs personally with many of these, so to speak, respected businessmen. It speaks volumes that when Putin served as vice mayor, his city had practically an official night governor, a mafia don. By the way, it's not only Prigozhin. A list of other shady characters with sordid pasts has begun to use the right-to-be-forgotten law to absolve their sins. But Putin decided these are all half measures. He introduced a law guaranteeing his total immunity in the state Duma. Although technically, the draft was actually proposed by Deputy Pavel Krishenikov and Senator Andrei Klishas. But Krishenikov and Klishas are avatars for the presidential administration. So we can say that it was Putin. He decided that current laws were too much fuss for Putin to deal with. It's easier to pass a law that basically forbids bringing Putin to trial. We used to have a law regulating presidential immunity. The law prohibited liability for acts committed by a sitting president. But it wasn't enough for Putin. Article 3 of the act now reads, the president of the Russian Federation who has finished his term, has immunity. He may not be held criminally or administratively liable, nor detained, arrested, interrogated, or searched. Do you see the difference? At some point, the words for acts performed by him during the term of office disappeared. So according to the old law, Putin could not have been tried for the deaths of children in Beslan for covering up Nemtsov's murderers, Navalny's poisoning, or the numerous assassinations of his opponents. It didn't seem like much, but now a president can't be charged for crimes committed before their presidency. The funny thing is, Putin seems determined not to stop after he finishes his term. Why else would there be such a broad interpretation of immunity? If you read the new law by the letter, it absolves Putin of everything. He could literally walk out the gates of the Kremlin after he resigns and, accompanied by witnesses, journalists and investigators, attack a woman, strangle her until she loses consciousness, steal her boots and earrings, and confess on camera. He can't even be detained. It may sound crazy, but it is part of the new law, and it is the only thing that distinguishes it from the previous one. I don't know about you, but it worries me. If that's the kind of law he wants, what does Putin intend to do after he resigns? But seriously, Putin and his gang are focused on having records of their acts erased. Which means we'll see more laws about forgetting and immunity. They may want everyone to forget, but it's our job to make that known and remembered. Want to talk about the 90s? Bring it on! For over 10 years, an investigative team of over 100 experts dug up my past. The widely accepted result is that I stole all my oil from myself. They couldn't find a more credible crime to pin on me. Now it's time to find some skeletons in their closets.
I understand that it is difficult, if not dangerous, to talk about these things in Russia, even when backed up by complete and verified information. Lawsuits, criminal charges, and even physical threats are possible. So, let me offer my assistance. Do you have information that you can't publish on your own? Send it to us. We'll check it out. If we can verify its authenticity, we will publish it, speak out, and when the time is ripe, hand it over to an independent prosecutor in the wonderful Russia of the future. Do the thugs in power want to hide their wrongdoings? Let's tell the whole world about them together. Then there will be no more right-to-be-forgotten law for them to hide behind. All the best!